kind of CSEPs. Uh, for those of you that haven't dealt with CSEPs, it's the component of DOJ that's uh, in, involved in investing in all sorts of uh, technology-related criminal activity uh, and really has uh, unique technical sophistication for a component of the federal government that deals with those issues. So also very impressive. Uh, over here, we've got Dylan Reisman, uh, re uh, independent researcher at Princeton University's Center for Information Technology Policy, or CITP. Uh, CITP uh, draws on researchers from different parts of the Princeton campus to do interdisciplinary work on tech policy. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Dylan's emblematic of that. Um, he's one of the rare folks who can talk both the technical side and the policy side with real expertise. Uh, his work at, at Princeton focuses on consumer privacy and algorithmic transparency. But before that, he was a, a, a real-life software engineer uh, on Google's privacy team. Uh, don't just take my word for it that he has real expertise in this area and impact. Um, in the FCC's recent privacy proceeding, Dylan got cited about a dozen times for some foundational aspects of, of data security and privacy. Uh, last but certainly not least, we've got Dave Dagan, uh, who's uh, co-director of the Astro Lavos Lab. Did I get that right? Cool. Um, uh, at Georgia Tech, which is a group that consists of computer science and electrical engineering researchers. Uh, and the lab conducts research on online attribution, forensics, and malware. So here's the game plan for this session. Uh, we're going to start with Dylan. Uh, he's going to kick us off with an explanation of modern online service architecture uh, and how it maps against government access to customer data. So a pre pretty detailed technical explanation. Uh, then David's going to share some war stories from his on-the-ground work with uh, malware and attribution. And Kim's going to share her experience uh, as a, a data breach attorney and a federal prosecutor in dealing with these issues from a legal perspective on the ground. So uh, that's going to be the prepared part. Uh, then we're going to switch to questions. I'll kick things off with one or two uh, uh, prepared questions and then open it up for you guys. So there's the game plan and Dylan, take away. Hi everybody. Uh, so as Jonathan said, my name is Dylan. Um, and I'm going to talk today about a sort of technical perspective on data localization. Or so titled, where are my emails really? Um, so just to continue with the job already introduced me. So I'm like, we're sitting in the business right now to expose research posts on web tracking, measurement, but privacy and privacy and different things. Uh, but today, actually, we're going to be talking about a lot more uh, sort of basic, sort of elemental parts of application architecture on the web and on the internet. Um, before I was at Princeton, as uh, Jonathan said, uh, said, I was at Google. Nothing in this presentation today reflects any insider knowledge of Google's infrastructure. And actually, kind of nice feature of something is that Google's actually released a lot of public uh, information, as has as have other companies. So we actually have a lot of um, sort of external sources to trust. So this is kind of the core question. When you move data on the internet, where is it really? Where is it in physical space? Um, so this kind of gets into the legal aspect of, well, is that even a relevant question? But before we even get to that, let's see, can we even sort of figure that out? So let's kind of walk through a pretty simple example. Lyft, if anyone here probably uses Lyft, and Atlanta seems to be a good place for Lyft. Um, Lyft is a car hailing app like, uh, like Uber. So you can ask for why. Presumably, Lyft stores this information somewhere on the, in their application, not just on your phone, but on a server somewhere online. So how can we figure out where Lyft stores your data? Well, I have my phone in my pocket and it has the Lyft application, and it's pretty trivial to actually intercept the traffic coming from the application and learn the name of the server it's talking to. In this case, the server is called api.lift.com. Uh, that's pretty simple, but at the same time, that doesn't really tell us anything more about where it is. So that's the question. Does api.lift.com map to a real, uh, real server somewhere? So here's the super naive approach, and we're going to deconstruct this in a little bit. But first, we could try to use IP addresses to geolocate a service. Uh, so what is an IP address? An IP address is the actual machine-readable address of a server on the internet. So what your computer does say when you type in a new website into a address, the address bar of your browser, you say, let's say I want to visit gatech.edu. Your computer app takes that gatech.edu string of characters and talks to a domain name system server, usually by default provided by your ISP. If you don't know what DNS is, it's probably your ISP. Um, and asks for the IP address. And it gets it, and it looks like something like this. Four dot separated bytes of information, 130, 207, 160, 173. That still doesn't really say anything. 
But this is actually where a lot of you know very accessible third-party databases come into play. There are third-party companies that make it their job to geolocate IP addresses on the internet. Uh, the most common use case for this is if a service needs to geolocate a user to say, you know, to, like you're visiting Google.com, but you live in Belgium, so you really want the Belgian Google.com, or you want it in French or something. But we could maybe abuse it to see, hey, maybe they have good data on where the application servers also are. So what, what's the data track? So let's take api.lit.com, ask the DNS server for um, for the IP address. The DNS server says, okay, api.lit.com, that's an alias for this long string, which I don't even know what that is, but that's directed to this address, which is drumroll in Ashburn, Virginia. Amazon data center US East One. Uh, it was actually very accurate. It said, oh, I have a pretty high confidence that it's within the zip code. And then it was pretty trivial to go to Google Maps and say, this is where the data is. So law enforcement trying to seize lift, maybe you would first try to knock on the store. Uh, and actually, there was like a nice little hint there. Amazon was nice and put it in the URL that they alias, but that's not a technical necessity. That's just something they do. So we can try this for other services. So Snapchat. Uh, so Snapchat, you know, when you uh, send an image, it goes to app.snapchat.com. Uh, so, but the thing is, when we try to access the IP, it might depend where we're accessing it from. So from New York City, from where I live, uh, it was accessing a Google data center in Georgia, a third-party database, returned actually with high confidence, saying, hey, this is probably the Google data center in Georgia. Okay, great. But then I tried it from Dublin. And the third party said, uh, it's a Google IP, but I don't really know where that is. And from Sydney, it said the same thing. It's a Google IP, and it could be anywhere. And that actually kind of raises an issue. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, well, maybe this data doesn't actually seem so useful. And so you might be tempted to conclude, oh, because api.lift.com points to Virginia, the Lyft ride history must be stored in Virginia. And because, say, inbox.google.com points to a data center in Georgia, my emails must be in Georgia, except that's like not true at all. Um, this is not at all any sort of conclusion we can draw from the data we have. Uh, the truth is that at most, what we've really concluded is that we've identified maybe a point in the network that our data passes through. Why is that so hard? Like, why does that happen? So it really comes down to the fact that IPs can be reallocated by their owner. So companies like Google and Facebook. Large companies control their own IP addresses. They can choose where they point to. And based on different routing schemes, which we'll talk a little bit about later, they might actually say, you know, today it'll point to a Google data center in Georgia, but tomorrow it might be one in Finland. We make no guarantee about where it points to. And that leads to the second point, which is the IP geolocation databases can be very inaccurate for this application because they try to draw on information that is provided from the owners of the IP addresses themselves. Except in this case, that information is super unreliable. But really, and this is the third point that gets into why applications on the internet work the way they do, the endpoint we talk to has nothing really to do with where the data is on the back end. So this is our first fun picture of the day. This here's Google. I mean, it's not really useful, but this is a this is actually an image provided by the Google Site Liability Engineering Team on kind of a toy infrastructure for how a Google service might work. What we've just been talking about so far is that connection number two on the internet. That's the open internet. Um, it's the user talking to what they call a GFD, the Google front end. That's really the point that the IP address is pointing to. Even if for 100% certainty you knew where that was, it doesn't say anything about the data which in this diagram is really represented by these databases here. And that's entirely hidden from you. It can be on their own, it's on their own proprietary fiber, behind all sorts of things. It's not addressable from the outside. So I can't really say where that is. And not to be nihilistic, it's really hard to draw these conclusions without that insider information. And this kind of leads to the first takeaway that I want to leave you with, which is that as an external auditor or external researcher, I can't make satisfying statements about location data. Um, so I, I can, we can run through that exercise for different services. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, only the data stewards themselves are really in a position to say anything about location data. Uh, 
Um, this kind of actually leads to a second conclusion, which we're going to talk about now, um, which is that the same principles of internet architecture that make it hard to do that exercise also make data localization a regressive technical concept from a purely technical standpoint. Uh, so let's kind of talk about that. It's, it's not a simple feature request to ask that data be located in one place in one place alone. It imposes requirements that can make uh, uh, international applications uh, unviable to deploy. Um, so there are several technical reasons for that. I have some nice pictures kind of illustrating why that is. And we're going to try and get into them, and hopefully it will be clear why that is. So let's consider an example. Let's say I'm a Huli user in Algiers, Huli Silicon Valley fans, um, and I send an email. Where does it go? That's really the question. Let's say it's a part of some invest investigation. You really want to know where that's located. Uh, the answer is it's probably in several places and possibly across borders and for any number of reasons. So here's one reason why that might be. First, it can be stored in edge, cache, edge caches across borders for speed. So let's say you send an email. There might be a primary data <laughs> place where the company says, this is really the home for this data. And maybe it's in France, because maybe France has cheap energy, better taxes, whatever, and it's cheaper to run a full-fledged data center and all of the application logic from France. But now, I mean, I'm in Africa. I want that data fast. It has to be fast. So what the company might do is implement a cache, a lighter weight server in that company, in that country, that will take a chunk of the data and, and serve it closer to the user. It's a pretty basic concept, actually. If you want something faster, just put it closer to the user, and that's what they did. But it won't store a whole copy of it, only store a chunk. How, what chunk does it, uh, how does it determine what chunk to serve? Well, it might choose it based on some algorithm. Maybe what was the most recent email will cache those, or maybe this is a public search results page, and everyone in this country is searching for this popular music star. So we should cache those results closer to the user. So that's how it can end up in multiple copies in multiple places and not even really configured by an engineer. The algorithm can be set by an engineer, but then it's left to its own devices to decide what is the optimal way to store and cache that data. Another thing why the why data might be stored in multiple places is it can be sharded across multiple machines in multiple data centers. Sharding is a very important concept here. So if I were developing an application today, a very simple messaging application, I might be tempted to just kind of have one machine with one database, a very large, let's say that machine had a very large hard drive, say even the, uh, uh, the hard drive in your laptop, and I might sort all of my customers' data there. Except that would Split up columns, say this is age, this is favorite color. They'll split up columns uh, vertically so that maybe this machine here has age and this has color and distribute it. What this means then is that on these machines, they can work much faster because all a, a very simple pattern has to do is it has to know I don't know the answer, but I know I can just quickly forward a user request to this machine. And this machine can keep the information in a form that is easily served from and served from fast. This also means that failures of machines don't affect the entire database. All you have to do is restore that star. So it makes data much more fluid and much more mobile. And now you can shard data across geographies or perhaps cache certain shards and not other shards. And this how this uh, how this plays with uh, with data localization is that those shards now don't have to be geographically dependent. They can be anywhere which is an efficiency that's realized by cross-border data transfers. A third way that data can really wind up anywhere is in replication for load balancing. So load balancing is, uh, is the practice of sending certain requests to different, uh, to different data centers in order to make sure that uh, information is, or that resources are used efficiently. So for instance, let's say I live in region A and region A uh, is overloaded with requests. Let's say it's working hours in region A. And so all of a sudden those requests might slow down and they might 
be less reliable, they might just time out, they must might fail. And that would not be a good user experience. So the company says, okay, idle service. We want to use our resources efficiently. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, that it would be faster if we just routed some of these requests from region A into region B in order to you know, serve the user faster. But in order to do that, I need to replicate my data from region A to region B to prepare for that possibility. And so that's just yet another way that data can cross the border. Uh, Pathways for redundancy. Services need to be uh, resistant to disaster. You know, if there's a hurricane or an earthquake, you need to be able to recover. Or even without natural disaster or any sort of catastrophic things, bugs happen. They're a reality of engineering that something will go wrong. So in order to prepare for that, you might have you know, your primary storage and then a storage system for when you're trying to update the first storage because you deployed a new version of a server or something. But then if you have a failure while you're updating, you need a third backup to handle it when the first two are offline because of any unexpected unforeseen circumstance. And so all of a sudden redundancy <laughs> is an important component of any sort of stable architecture. Those backups can live anywhere and they can live in different forms. They can be in tape stored in some room in some you know, Midwestern state. They can be really deployed anywhere in order to recover anywhere. Let's say your French data center went down and you have all these French customers. You wouldn't want to tell your French customers, hey, you lost a third of your inbox. No one here would be happy if all of a sudden you're Across like search or artificial intelligence, like Google has that new feature where your e they suggest an email response to you. They learn that from people's emails. And whether or not they should be doing this, it's something they do. And it's a feature that a company would expect to be able to perform. So, for instance, consider this. You have different data centers all across the world storing different copies of different data. And now it would be when you actually send a let's say you send an email, you expect that email to be ready as soon as it's received. You know, you want it to be in your inbox pretty soon after you've sent it. But you might not expect it to be searchable immediately, or you might not expect it to have learned any sort of artificially intelligent thing about what you're doing. So a common sort of design practice and sort of, sort of design pattern is to process offline <coughs> a sort of batch mode. So what this batch means is they might say, okay, once a month, twice a month, we're going to run a very expensive computation. And on that day, when that day comes, all of the data is going to go to one single point. And now it doesn't matter that we have one single point of failure because we don't care if it doesn't work on one day. It just has to work on some day. And so then they can do this very extensive computation in one place and then derive data in that one place. So now you have some version of derived data that might reflect the original data and it's in a different country and we don't even really know how to treat it. So that's another sort of obstacle to data localization that perhaps there's, there's good reason why this should be done. It would be too expensive to deploy that extensive computation to every data center in the world. Sort of the last point here is that you want your data to be accessible by engineers, and possibly in different countries, for doing like maintenance and debugging. Logging and monitoring is an extremely important part of developing a stable application. So let's say you have an Irish user, or me in Algiers, a Hulu customer, and I uh, and I'm using my uh, application. And let's just say, even though this might not necessarily be true, that the entire computation and all the data access is happening in one country. There's still the question of all of the logs going possibly to a different logging server, usually in the United States. So this could represent metadata about that uh, about your personal data, you know, the times you accessed it, what services you use. And an engineer has to be able to access it. And now a good company will have controls on who has a lot to access and for what reasons they have a lot to access. But it needs to be accessible at some point um, in order to even have a stable application. And in terms of the data itself, 
if an engineer has to make a deeper dive into understanding why some data corruption happened or what was the nature of some bug, they have to be able to you know, inspect the data. Uh, obviously with some control, but generally it's not like there's going to be an engineering team in every single country that can handle only that use, only that country's users issues. So that kind of leads us to what were all of these overarching principles. And these are the principles that any sort of responsible engineer needs to take into account when considering how to build a stable application. And it's principles that benefit largely from cross-border data storage uh, versus performance. An application has to be fast. Scalability. If today my application has a thousand users, it has to be ready for the possibility that tomorrow we have a million users. So we need to be able to add resources effectively. You can't just be constrained to one data set potentially. If, like for instance, myself right now, I run a service on Amazon AWS. I run it in a data center that's located in, in that Virginia data center, actually. Tomorrow, if all of a sudden my service had a million more users, it would be very simple at a click of a button to say, okay, replicate, just copy the service and put it in double. And it would be really helpful for me to do so. And there's no control on that. And that's a benefit to engineers who want to run effective, stable, and fast applications. The third point, sorry, um, the third point is reliability and availability. You need the application to be available. There's something that a lot of Googlers say uh, is that when people check for their internet connection, they check for Google.com. Like that Google.com to many people is the stability of the internet. So you want pages like Google.com or Facebook.com or Twitter.com to always be available as much as reasonably possible. So people will say, okay, a service should be up for a certain number of nines of availability. So if I say I want the service to be up for five nines of availability, that means it has to be up for 99.99% of the year. That's such an infinitesimally small amount of time that a service can go down. And that is the sort of reliability that companies shoot for. Uh, fourth, data integrity, kind of already touched on this. You need to be able to recover from disaster. Those disasters could affect one country and not the other, but you want infrastructure in a different country to be able to pick up the slack for that other country's users. Uh, I think that's pretty self explanatory. Uh, the last point is cost and efficiency. Obviously, you want to do this so that it doesn't break the bank. You want it to be still a viable uh, product that makes a profit, and you want it to be efficient. You, know, you don't want to have excess resources. That kind of goes into cost. When you issue a link, when you load a web page, you are consuming resources on a physical server. There's a computer, like the computer in front of you on a laptop, that is processing that request. And it can only do a certain amount in a certain amount of time. And you want, as, a, uh, as an application owner, to use your, uh, your computers as efficiently as possible. You don't want idle servers, and you don't want overloaded servers. So all of these kind of considerations lead to a lot of really important questions for any sort of data sovereignty regime, or even before data, you get into data sovereignty, just questions for the nature of data, which is how would the law impose restrictions on how data can be cached? How should the law even regard cached data? Is cached data or copies of data? Does it receive the same protections as other data? Or are there restrictions on the algorithms that can be used to cache data? Should the law treat uh, data derived from user data differently than the user data itself? The answer is probably yes, but there are a number of degrees of different types of derived data. For instance, if you have an email inbox, perhaps I have derived data that says, I have figured out that Jonathan's email has a flight reservation on it. And I derive that data and I say, Jonathan has a flight reservation. I think we would all say that's, that's still his data. But now let's say I train a machine learning model and to, in order to predict from anyone's email whether or not they have a flight reservation. And it's been trained on, as in, it has taken features from everyone here's data. Does that model now represent all of our personal data? Or is there a point, a threshold at which it's no longer anyone's data? These are really complex questions that I don't necessarily know the answer to, but have to be grappled with. There are so many more questions. Um, how do you weigh application integrity against data sovereignty rules? You know, like, well, obviously, we would say, you know, a lot, the law of land is supreme, but does that mean that applications break when they sort of, you know, might have, like, for instance, when a country shuts down access to internet, that sort of runs against all of these sort of sovereignty issues. Uh, what are the costs of maintaining the necessary redundancy in many regions? If you actually did have a strict data privacy, uh, data sovereignty regime, does that mean you would need 
to win data centers in every country in order to have this necessary redundancy, the cost would explode. Uh, and there are other points how this data have to move, this data have to move on a travel user. Where do you even consider the nationality of the user's data? Uh, can an engineer in one country even access user data? Can they even have access to logs for servers running in other countries? These questions all kind of, you know, the, this gets into the part where I'm not aware, but obviously parts of Washington technology agnostic about, you know, not advocating for certain implementations or certain other sort of too strict features of tech. But these are questions that just don't seem to be addressed, which is data has this ephemeral nature to it, and the law just doesn't grapple with that at all. And these are the sorts of issues that engineers think about, that they have all of this data and all of this derived data, and we don't know how to account for it. And it just doesn't seem like, though, that forcing this notion that data can live in one place, especially within one country's borders, it doesn't appear to be the right way to go about it. And it seems to be a technically impressive way to go about it. Anyway, these are some interesting resources. Maybe I can share the slides later. But there are actually cool resources out there that um, that have uh, that are very readable, very easy to, uh, or actually, I think, readable to even a non-technical audience, like Google's a Site Reliability Engineering Teams book, um, which can describe some of these concepts in more detail. And I invite you to look at them, because they're actually very useful. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any more questions, I look forward to talking to you guys. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dave Dagan, and I'm at the Georgia Tech DC department, uh, where I help uh, run the Astro Labos lab. And uh, I spare you the slides today. Faculty rules require that they be you know, 60 some slides with a quiz, so we'll avoid that today. Um, in terms of what we do in the Astro Labos lab, we run large scale evaluation of malware. Tens and tens of millions of samples, analyzing them, storing them, comparing them. Uh, we also associate with that network traffic information from data partners. And from there, we apply machine learning principles. Uh, one of the primary outputs is papers. So if you're suffering from insomnia, we have cured that. And uh, some of the unintended side effects include things like startups, uh, books, and um, uh, uh, occasional grants. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of the history of abuse remediation and how cleanup has worked so that we can talk uh, specifically about a, a more recent example and then understand where we are at in terms of policy choices. So in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, abuse remediation and cleanup on the internet was uh, largely performed on, on a one-off basis. Uh, we've done everything from calling people, people that we've worked with have, have done things like home visits to infected individuals. This is in the early, early days of the internet, where if somebody has a virus or is exhibiting uh, an infected behavior, uh, it's quite possible the ISP could literally call them up uh, or send somebody to their home. Uh, since then, uh, there's been a, a, obviously a dramatic professionalization of the field, as well as a reduction of that remediation capability to a uh, series of outsourced call centers. Uh, so not much progress is made there. The problem is simply addressed, uh, but not billable. Uh, starting in, uh, well, July 2003 is the day the internet changed, the month the internet changed. Uh, this is the creation of the SOFIG and MIGUN uh, viruses. And this is, uh, something that brought us into a completely new realm. Previously, malware authors had been almost entirely focused on um, individual achievement, curiosity. They were tinkerers. There's the proverbial person in the basement trying to understand technology and perhaps overstepping some bounds. Uh, in 2003, these viruses came out that were associated with spams. There was a monetization of malware. And once you had organized crime working with virus writers, something we realized. Things are going to change forever. We at Georgia Tech, we literally stopped areas that we're working on and focused entirely on this problem. We said this is going to change the internet now that money is involved. Um, in the early days, we ran some of the very first sinkholes. We were in 2004 running sinkholes on the internet. This is where we take over some of the malicious domains or have them pointed to the university 
so that we can collect information about who was infected and then hopefully notify them through some a variety of means, either emails to the ASN operators or contacting the ISPs, um, or uh, hoping that someday a private market would spring up for the NSPL information, which later happened. Um, uh, we were in the early days uh, discussing this mass infection phenomenon. Our proposed term was IRC ones, because we thought that most captured what they were. Uh, but on some of the earlier mailing lists to discuss this, the phrase botnet was first uttered by someone to describe this phenomenon that we were all watching and then sort of stuck and became part of uh, its popular culture. Someday it'll have a dictionary entry. Um, Around that time, uh, many of the ISPs were becoming professionalized. They were consolidating, they were becoming part large, they could afford to have professional staff, and they were worried about remediation and the impact of bandwidth on their resources. Around that time, about 80% of TCP 425 traffic was associated with spam. And the projection was that it'll asymptotically go to nearly 100% um, of all traffic being associated with spam. And this is perceived to be a, a barrier for the internet. It would cause a, a loss of trust, or even worse, a, a creation of policy and perhaps law. Um, and so the inter-industry organizations, uh, things like work groups like MOG and other uh, collections of industry were privately working on this problem. And a interesting side effect occurred because you had in the room all of the key operators, switch operators, technical people, uh, working groups were created where it was decided they would individually take on specific malware infections to try and remediate them because they were perceived to be of a, of a certain crisis proportion. Um, in, in terms of our participation, we provided a lot of the resources for that infrastructure. We've been, we had been running sinkholes for, other, for, for quite some time and a lot of other groups as well provided. So um, we then now have, since then, uh, since around the uh, early 2000, mid 2000s, going to 2010, the creation of an industry that was providing um, data and information around the infection. So uh, uh, individuals who are infected would, would connect to a sinkhole either at Georgia Tech or other places. If they come to Georgia Tech, they might wind up in a graph somewhere, anonymized, but if they connect to other sinkholes, they turn into a data product. And uh, data clearinghouses appear to be the current model that we're using for uh, trying to remediate this problem. It isn't largely working, although um, it is spectacularly successful for some investors. So I wanted to look specifically at, at, at the case that we were working with uh, called the Mariposa botnet and walk you through some of the, the, the scenarios there. Uh, some of the researchers that we worked with were uh, tracking an infection uh, known as the butterfly botnet, the Mariposa. And in analyzing the malware and looking at its network behavior, we were able to determine that although the operators were using VPNs, we could nonetheless still find them. In, in, we believed it was in Spain and uh, less certain we had a street address and a name and all of that. We could look like it something we could provide attribution to. Um, now, at the time, uh, we were in the U.S. and most of the victims that we're, work, uh, that we're working with were in the U.S. And um, there was law enforcement interested in this, of course, but we wanted to accelerate this process because we felt that, well, we, we actually think we know who this person might be. We lack some of the uh, uh, permissive access to uh, things that you would get from a subpoena in order to confirm this. But we, we believe, uh, based on machine learning principles, that we have identified the individual. Um, so at the time, um, it, it looked like the case might not go anywhere simply because, well, we had a name, but it was a foreign uh, individual, and there's a much, uh, there's a very complicated process <laughs> of uh, mutual assistance doctrine that goes back to the 50s. Um, and the, the, the principal limitation there is that um, there's a finite number of mutual assistance <laughs> that can be sought. And so if we were to try and use that path, it would probably compete with all of the other uh, needs for assistance, some of which might be a higher priority. And so in analyzing the situation, we realized, well, from our working group experience, we know that there are cybersecurity researchers in Spain, and we know that there are victims in Spain, <coughs> and we've heard that there are courts in Spain as well, and we think that's the ingredient you need uh, to start a process locally. 
And so we worked with cybersecurity companies in Spain, providing them information about what we knew. Um, and uh, they were able to contact the Guardia Civil and were able to convince a Spanish judge under what the, their equivalent of due process is that a, uh, a warrant would issue so that further investigation should take place. Once, of course, on the US side, they, this appeared to be in motion. Suddenly, uh, the fate of this, uh, the, the priority of this investigation <coughs> increased greatly because now there was uh, obviously judicial interest in Spain. And so one workaround besides simply getting in line and waiting your turn from MLATS is to recognize that botnets have infections everywhere. There, you can, you can have jurisdiction everywhere. There might be some ethical considerations that someone might may wish to address about shopping a forum, but certainly you could find uh, uh, victims in almost any country. Um, and in this particular case, Spain was we thought quite relevant because we believed the operator was there. In fact, they were. Uh, the operators were uh, uh, tried, uh, convicted. They did serve time. In fact, they finished serving time. Um, and so the, the entire process worked. Um, and for that reason, we're now at Georgia Tech, at least, talking about this publicly for, for the first time. Uh, others had, had talked about this during, during the case that fine. Uh, as a result of this sort of innovative use of private and public uh, information, uh, then Director Mural, Mueller had commented that this is a model for how future investigations might take place. Uh, and some of the researchers that were involved in this, we, we take no credit in that, we, we just run machines. But some of the researchers involved in this were some of the first non-FBI agents to receive the director's award. Uh, which, which I think gives them some lunch privileges at most. <laughs> it's a nice recommendation, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice commendation for, for their considerable effort. Um, and, and so it, it, in the larger sense, you can see that there's been an evolution of remediation efforts. There are some ancient, uh, perhaps I shouldn't call them ancient, but there are some established legal doctrines and processes that are perhaps not as agile as we might like them to be. We've been trying to innovate ways to um, uh, uh, speed this up or uh, recommend policy changes that are appropriate or perhaps needed for the internet era. I'd like to uh, close with just a few comments about the future of cybercrime and attribution. Um, the work that we had done all through the 1990s and up through the 2000s were largely focused on criminals, traditional criminals, uh, uh, be they um, just individuals who have made poor choices or organized gangs that were monetizing, stealing money, draining people's life savings, things of that sort. Um, and to some extent, you can say, well, uh, this is a problem that society can manage. We just simply played a small part in learning how society would manage this problem. But there's been a more recent change in how cybercrime um, is, is addressed. Uh, there's been a very uh, innovative and impressive extension of U.S. investigative powers uh, so that the uh, cyber criminal operators overseas are occasionally being you know, picked up in airports. This is being perceived by other countries as a projection of power by the United States, uh, that perhaps this is a bit too far, um, and that there might be some uh, need for the traditional MLAT uh, processes instead of these sort of innovative uh, uh, opportunistic uh, arrest situations. At the same time, on the other you know, sort of end of the spectrum, some countries have decided that there is an organic cyber criminal organization within their borders, and they will co-opt them because these operators are often very good at programming and very good at conducting nation state operations. And so I think over time, we'll continue to see a diminishment, dis dis uh, a reduction of the sort of traditional cyber criminals in favor of the uh, 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 use of this capability for the projection of power, either in very innovative and aggressive enforcement or uh, um, on the other side, capture of criminal organizations to serve national needs. Um, the previous speakers have noted that there's also been a consolidation of logs that information and sites that we interact with are no longer dispersed into thousands of mom and pop ISPs and colos around the internet. Now they're all in major data centers. Um, and for that reason, many of the traditional cyber crime problems that we face will probably be more easily addressed because those organizations have very uh, uh, organized practices for releasing information, requiring subpoenas, insisting upon a certain process being followed, as well as a review 
uh, of an impact of, uh, of user privacy uh, uh, on these processes. So um, I, I think the more traditional problem of cyber crime, it will be, quote, managed in ways that we didn't expect it. It was the market that determined that the consolidation of record logs would make this problem uh, sort of go away for us. And the other uh, larger problem, who the operators are, their co-optation or uh, 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 you know, being driven out from some jurisdiction and driven into the embrace of some jurisdictions, I think, uh, will be uh, the principal problem that we'll be dealing with um, uh, in this decade if we are not already. Um, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll close my remarks and I look forward to your questions. And as Kim comes up, people. <laughs> We're going to extend this panel till 10 or quarter after. Um, we, we actually had a little question built into the afternoon. And, uh, anyone else can do it? Okay. Thanks, Gary. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm very happy to. This isn't a typical forum that I present at, so it's always nice to hear different perspectives. And as I have a couple minutes to talk, um, I'm just going to try to share some practical perspectives on law enforcement investigations, which is hard to do in 10 minutes, so I'll try to put echo I think we're getting feedback from one of the questions. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Technical point. And I think what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so is just talk about high-level principles of law enforcement um, challenges in investigating cybercrime today. My experience on the law enforcement side is about um, eight years seven to eight years um, dated now, which is an eternity in, in uh, cybercrime and the world of cybercrime. So I think the challenges that law enforcement faces today is probably much more significant than what we faced um, uh, eight or 10 years ago. But when I was at DOJ, I was there from 2002, I prosecuted the first Fisher um, way back then, an AOL email that went out with spelling errors in it. Um, uh, and then all the way to 2010, when um, I was the lead prosecutor for um, the Albert Gonzalez set of hacking cases, which was the TJ hacker, um, and a string of, of, of payment card related uh, breaches. And actually, I had started working with him when he was a source for our investigation starting in 2003 which was the shadow crew um, in, uh, takedown that we did of a, the first website dedicated to uh, trading in the black market of stolen credit card information and financial information. He was the source for that investigation in which we took down um, the website, the 25 people running it essentially, um, working with foreign law enforcement and, and other things. Global search warrants at the same time and taking that down. So that was, that was the first um, time we had really looked at how to run an international investigation. All the way fast forward eight years later, again, when we were going after him and his co-conspirators in Eastern Europe, taking down a global organized syndicate, going after uh, targeting human card data. And again, a different type of international um, cooperation and investigation. Um, but all of this starts with law enforcement's ability to work with a different entity. And I think that's what makes cybercrime investigations so challenging in contrast to other types of cases. And law enforcement has understood this over time. The way the FBI <coughs> Secret Service acts today compared to the way they acted 15 years ago in interfacing with victims is dramatically different. They understand how much they need, to, how much they're relying on, victim, reliance on victims to cooperate in their investigation. So what does that mean? Um, it means that um, they might have some information of a, about a, a hack occurring on a victim entity, but unless that victim works with them, their alternative is to subpoena them for anything relevant to the, to the incident that might have occurred, which means they might end up getting 200 systems. They don't want 200 systems to look at. What they want is the victim to help them out, to do the investigation on their own, to preserve all relevant information, and then help them understand what they need to understand very quickly because they don't have the kind of resources to do that. So that's that's point um, number one, how much um, that they're reliant on victims and how the victims' agendas are not the same in law enforcement. So one would think, well, anyone who's, you know, any company who is the subject of a cybercrime attack would want to, to quickly investigate it and 
resolve it, work with law enforcement. Well, the company wants to protect its customers, its systems, and its operations, and get back to work as quickly as possible. And that often doesn't involve trying to find the criminal behind the attack. Sometimes it does, but it's more of a secondary benefit. So you immediately have law enforcement working with entities where they have sometimes the same aligned interests, but often they can diverge. Um, so it's often when law enforcement really starts its investigation that the company is ready to be done with the investigation. So that's point number one, the reliance on the victim entity. The second is um, immediately when they get, when there's an attack, and law enforcement starts to get, wants to investigate, they're interested in the IP addresses, they're interested in the malware, can four pieces of evidence so they can um, start looking at what happened on the system. And that often immediately leads them to have to work very quickly with many different countries. So in my experience, it wasn't just, okay, we've got an IP address and it goes back and it geolocates here, we have to reach out to that country and preserve that evidence. You're almost immediately working with many countries, five, 10, 20 countries. We had uh, takedowns involving evidence, targets, um, and individual actors in 40 countries sometimes. So it's the global network of cybercrime investigation that law, and has, law enforcement has to, to work with. Um, so the important point about um, the international targets, witnesses, and evidence, um, it has implications for both the law enforcement side and the prosecution side. The law enforcement side is very different, though, than the prosecution side. What we wanted often is the informal way of collecting the evidence and working with different countries. That's the only way that it could quickly unfold where the evidence might be, where the targets might be, where the, where the witnesses might be in different countries. Um, very different than when we started to think about whether we could even go forward with the prosecution, which is much further down the line after you collect the evidence, after you even get to the attribution stage, then you think about, okay, now I've got to have all the tick and tie things. I have to have the formal legal process. I have to have collected things um, in the right way so I can present it in court. But in most cases, we never get to that stage because um, of the challenge of getting attribution, but also because um, there's different approaches you can take. You know, there's, there's strategies behind what you want to do with international criminals. One, only one of which is to, as you mentioned, as Dave, I think, mentioned, one of our strategies was to we want to indict as many as we can and see if we can capture them in various airports. And we had success with that. Um, but that's only one strategy. Often another strategy we had was let's take the case, the best information, the evidence we can go to our international law enforcement partner and hope that they can take we can uh, more quickly do arrests and or prosecutions in their own countries. So that's a different alternative we had. And then thirdly, Sometimes all that we wanted to do was to get all the evidence we could, wrap it up, package it, and just present it to a, a foreign country to do with it what they wanted. So a lot of different approaches, um, a lot of different approaches when you have an um, international cyber crime component. So the three things I wanted to mention again, reliance on the victim entity and the complications and challenges thereof. Um, the second is cyber crime is almost immediately international targets, international evidence, international witnesses, all which bring challenges to um, both the law enforcement collection, preservation, evidence gathering, and further down the prosecution. And then thirdly, the different approaches um, that you have as law enforcement. It isn't always, I want to gather the information, have it transported back to the country, back to the home country, and hopefully get the criminal at some point in time to prosecute. So, I know we're going to have some questions about this to get into uh, more detail, but I just want to present some high-level principles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to lead off with a, a question and then open it up uh, for questions from the audience. Um, so I want to ask a question that I think bridges uh, uh, Dylan's uh, technical explanation and Kim's government experience, and that is, um, that uh, a business can store and process data uh, in a foreign country now uh, without having any personnel or any administrative access in that country. They have a server there, but they have no means of uh, getting at the data. Uh, the, 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 the country the server is in has no means of getting at the data on the server. Um, and we think about an overseas business, 
doing that in the United States, it's, it's understandably quite concerning for law enforcement. Uh, on the other hand, when we think about a U.S. business doing that in, for instance, Russia or China, uh, then suddenly it seems like a pretty good idea for enabling our businesses to, to uh, offer services to customers overseas uh, without acceding to lax views on surveillance. Uh, so the questions I want to ask are first, Dylan, could you explain how you would build a service like that, given that some companies are doing it? Uh, and then Kim, uh, how do you think about reconciling the, the benefits and drawbacks of building services like that from a law enforcement perspective? Well, I don't want to say it's trivial to build such a service that is completely protected from any sort of data access by a local government, but it is pretty simple. It's a pretty simple sort of architecture to do so. In fact, a lot of the big companies you can think of as a best practices sort of thing probably already do some version of this. So for instance, if you have a data center in a country like Russia, and you know you say, okay, I have to have this data center in Russia, but I don't want the Russian government to have access to that data, then what you do is you encrypt the drives. So you use encryption uh, and you have a key. You don't keep the key in Russia, but you keep the encrypted data in Russia. So then when it's, sto when it's actually stored in some country, then it's not possible for, say, the Russian government to come knock on the door of the data center and say, hey, we're going to seize the drives. If they could even know exactly which drives have the data they're looking for, assuming they, even if they could do that, then it's very, you know, it's tech, extremely technically feasible to say encrypt the drives so that when it's served, it's decrypted on the fly, but in storage, it's not. And the key could be stored in, say, the United States. It's not any sort of stretch to say, yes, this data that we're storing in this country is not at all readable for the local government. That's really what it comes down to. Can you repeat the question again? Uh, sure. Uh, so, when do you take from a law enforcement perspective on? Um, the possibility that a company might have data in a country, uh, but there's no ability for the local law enforcement agencies to get their hands on that data, either uh, physically or via a process. Uh, uh, does, that, does that seem, what would the balance of benefits and trade offs there seem like in light of that, depending on the country at issue, um, we might like the idea or might not like the idea? Right. I mean, one can, I mean, Obviously, understand that would be very frustrating for law enforcement who are trying to investigate a crime and they have some reasonable expectation that the data that they want to get access to is in their country, and there's no way to do that, nothing that the, the company can do. Um, so, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just that if that were to occur um, in a country at any number of places, that I can imagine the country, the country over time. We figure out some solution to that, whether they would enact something that says you have to have some. Well, we've had all those debates here, right? Um, and you know, law enforcement um, is not going to be in a very happy position if they can't get access to the data. So one would expect that there's going to be some workaround um, that they um, try. I mean, that's another thing is just if you can't get access to the data, you are. This is a great paper published by Lauren Perkins, you know, on encryption workarounds. Um, so law enforcement is going to try different techniques just because you can't get in one place access to the data. There often there's other places that they can get uh, get the evidence they need. But if, they, if they're, frustrated, they're too frustrated over time with practices that are occurring in a you know, country, one would expect that that might have to change. All right, uh, questions from the audience. Questions in regards to law enforcement, uh, control, legal assistance. Do you ever have an incident where trying to get assistance from a country that did not have positive diplomatic relations with the United States? Yeah, all the time. How did that go? <laughs> not well. Um, <laughs> there are certain, certain countries where we didn't try. We knew we weren't going to be able to get any information. It was you know, things were routed through there that we needed to um, get access to. We knew it was a dead end. Luckily, um, there were still an, um, countries that the criminal syndicates were using, even if they were located in those countries, they were using infrastructure in other countries that were um, friendly to us. And perhaps that's one advantage to the issues that you discussed about where the data all goes, because there's different places 
that the criminals also used, staging servers. A lot of them ended up being in Western Europe, sometimes in South America. So they were using, you know, uh, servers in many different locations. And oftentimes there was some ability to get access to some of those servers because they were in a friendly country. Well, there, uh, there are many dimensions to that. So there, all, there were situations, certainly, where there's political di disagreements between the companies on a different level, and law enforcement still work together. But there were certain countries where it, we knew it would be difficult to get evidence um, if we served them with legal process to do that, which we need to remember the system is true. Um, just as a follow-up to that, um, so, uh, when seeking the assistance of, of foreign governments or foreign researchers, it's often best to express the problem in terms uh, that they can understand vis-a-vis uh, -vis their victims. So if there are victims in that foreign country, that's what you lead with, right? That, that's how you describe the problem. Sure, there are victims that you care about and that you're serving the needs of, but uh, the more you can describe the problem as, as something that affects their daily life or affects their citizenry, the better chance you have. There are um, many situations though where uh, we know the information that we pass to foreign law enforcement will uh, not be worked or, or, or acted upon. And in fact, it will be sent to the criminal authors. Uh, in some cases, uh, there's coordination. And in, in some, it, it's useful still nonetheless to go through this exercise to figure out what class of operator are you dealing with? Is this somebody who pays a cut to the foreign government or is uh, working with them? Or do they merely just simply pass the information through? Or do they actually take action because the criminals have failed, have neglected to include uh, the appropriate amount of local bribes? Um, and so it's still useful to engage a sort of MLAT light type uh, process, uh, even if at the, out at the outcome, at the, at, the, at the start of this, you know that there'll be no useful result besides this simple oracle of understanding the dimensions of the criminal group you're, you're looking at. I would echo that because we, it, it all was part of a strategic approach too. We knew that at the end of the day, in a particular country, we identified a person and we had a rock solid case, you know, paper trail, um, you know, foot high on a criminal. We knew we could um, sit on it and not do anything because we don't, Expect you know positive results from the country, or we can try. And sometimes we didn't try, and we got lucky. But we have to do the agenda of the individual country vis a vis those individual peers. So there was just sort of the available approaches for any given matter, and I wouldn't say there was just one path to follow. So over lunch, we talked a little bit about. Um, voluntary cooperation, not just from victims, but also from service providers, uh, who, for instance, uh, were uh, um, uh, uh, staging point for an attack. V victims, in another sense, perhaps. Um, and uh, and uh, could could you say a little bit about how that voluntary cooperation outside of the MLAT process, uh, in some cases, enabled the investigation? Sure, and I think you had great examples on that. Um, there's often for a service provider a provision that if, if their systems are being used for criminal activity, that they, um, you know, the terms of service are otherwise allowed, um, uh, they're allowed to turn that information over to law enforcement. So there's a fair amount of that that occurs um, when companies um, are otherwise, you know, involved in a criminal activity um, where they can provide information to law enforcement without a legal process. We had one from oh. online. Okay, then let's do that. Okay. Um, I, how can people protect their privacy rights from the surveillance of state actors and business corporations? I mean, this is broad. That's trivial. Uh, make your own hardware, right? Your own operating system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> terrible idea. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's a learning process, right? Uh, but uh, you 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 should uh, largely look to uh, look with suspicion on um, uh, corporate uh, 
uh, operators who do not charge for their services. So if you're not paying, you are the, the product, right? Uh, and um, even if you are paying for a service, uh, you should certainly consider that the information that you provide uh, is still reachable. Uh, if what you're doing requires that amount of uh, extreme privacy, you should probably be running your own equipment or not doing it in the first place. But if you if you simply are concerned about privacy and, and don't want to have to worry about these issues, the best approach is to use software that you can audit or systems that you yourself operate. Um, it's still possible. It's a diminishingly small window left where you can go get um, your own allocations or a, a swift uh, cider block. You can go to most colas. It is uh, not the end-to-end -end dream that we had in the 90s of people running a machine in their home. Uh, but, but that works. If that's a bit too dear for you, you can also um, uh, use anonymity networks, which allow you to host and store information. You now, of course, own all of the problems uh, that one of our presenters described in terms of content distribution, replication, cybersecurity. It would sound like a full-time job. I, I think I'm going to push back on that a little bit, though, because I think I think going down that road leads to kind of this privacy and security nihilism. That's like, I can't, you know, I can't run my own services. So I give up, game over, there's nothing I can do. And like the first step to doing any of this is you have to threat model. You know, you have to say, like, why do I care about privacy? Why do I care about privacy from corporations? What's my contract with Google or Facebook or, you know, my ISP? What, what are my expectations? So, you know, people would call me some of a privacy advocate, but, you know, I use Google, I use Facebook because. I understand what I'm getting. Um, and that's actually a big part of the problem is that there's an information asymmetry and that customers don't, or rather I should say users, don't know what say your company's doing. But that doesn't mean by default that these companies are evil. You know, they are providing the service. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean that there is a, you know, that, but also at the same time doesn't mean that they aren't doing something that you might be unhappy with. So there are like incremental steps you can take. Um, for usable sort of privacy and security browser extensions, plugins, things like that. But really, the first step is you have to kind of question yourself and say, why do I care? Personally, I do not find myself, I am not sensitive personally to the idea of NSA surveillance. I'm familiar with the idea that they're controlled on it. I'm not by any means a national security lawyer. I cannot speak any of myself. But I understand that there are some controls on that. It's not my priority. I am concerned about, say, the scrutiny of my peers or what my information might be used in the future. And that includes information that Google collects. So I will you know, think about why I use a certain service. What information should I put in emails? What information should I not put in emails? What other services might offer me greater benefits than, say, Google? So maybe I use an application like Signal, which is a very usable messaging application. So it comes down to usability. And I just think there's this big problem now where, or especially kind of post Snowden, where there's kind of this sense in the privacy community that everything sucks and I'm trying to defend myself against literally everything and there's nothing I can do and I should start using PGP and encrypt all my emails, even though you, if you're not familiar with PGP, it's this horrible piece of software that's existed for 20 years, over 20 years, uh, and you can't use it. It's unusable. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean that it's hopeless. It just means you really have to scrutinize why you're doing the things you're doing. I'm always shocked too that um, I um, do a lot of internal investigations <laughs> in companies and with now BYOD and policies and how much individuals turn over to companies who have full access, usually because their policies are well drafted, to all of the information on that they use in the company, which often includes a lot of personal information because they're using the, the networks for that. Um, and their smartphone and other reasons, and, and they sign a policy that says they get access to that if there's an internal investigation, that, that individuals aren't more worried about that because companies can turn over that information to law enforcement. Um, they don't have the restrictions of ECPA and other things, and it never seems to be a concern for, for individuals. Yet they're concerned about the NSA monitoring them. That dichotomy has never really, never really quite understood that. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up at that point. Uh, regrettably, we didn't solve online privacy. We had a good conversation. <laughs> All right, thanks, everyone. I think we're moving straight into the next session. I, I